Can you reconcile with a narcissist? Forgiveness is one thing, but reconciliation? In this video, we're going to get into the subject. Now first, for those of you who are new to my channel, I'm Shanine Megji. I'm a transition coach. Welcome to my YouTube channel on Toxicity is Not Your Destiny. My mission is to help people navigate toxic relationships and environments in their lives from a biblical, practical, and spiritual perspective. So if you like this video, take a moment to click that subscribe button, click that bell, because every week I'm going to be bringing you a new video to empower you in navigating toxic relationships and environments. So now let's dive into the subject. In a previous video, I talk about what forgiveness looks like with a narcissist. Jesus engaged in radical forgiveness with his abusers, the ones who were responsible for his death on the cross. But does God ever call us to reconcile with our abusers? After all, isn't God all about restoring relationships? It's a tricky response. The reason is because narcissism is not a black and white issue. Narcissism falls on a continuum. So you can have someone who's healthy right smack in the center. Then further along the line, you have someone who may have some narcissistic traits. And even further down the line, someone who may be one of the several types of narcissists that exist. And then when you get to the end of the spectrum, you may be dealing with somebody who is a malignant narcissist and someone who's going into being a psychopath. So because of this continuum, there is no black and white answer. And I'm not going to give you a yes or no answer, but what I do want to share are some observations from the Bible about God's mind on the matter. So just to start, I believe it is possible for some people who have narcissistic traits, who may have some capacity for self-reflection, who have some heartfelt empathy, to be able to reconcile. It's really for you to get God's wisdom and guidance on that. But then again, I wouldn't call those people narcissists. In today's video, I wanna talk about those people who are more malignant narcissists, whose traits of narcissism are more deeply entrenched in their personality. So these would be people who don't self-reflect but blame shift, they lack empathy, they lie and manipulate, they are cruel, vindictive, cutting, and abusive. And these traits persist across many situations, across most relationships in the narcissist's life over a long period of time. So you might have gotten out of such a relationship because it was so toxic, so abusive, and so destructive. And so now that you're out, you might be wondering, is there any hope that maybe one day I could be reconciled with this person? Because after all, if that person could just shed their narcissistic traits once and for all and become more Christ-like, like who they're called to be, they'd be a great person to have around. Maybe you've thought, well, if there's a break for a year or two or maybe several years, maybe down the road, eventually we'll reconcile. One day we will be in each other's lives again, and there could be something there. Maybe God is just going to work on our hearts during this time apart and make us better people. And you know, sometimes we have that hope that things can change. Even though the ending was so terrible and traumatic, maybe the break or separation could lead to something good in the relationship later. So let's take a look at a biblical perspective on this issue. I want to look at the story of Jacob and Laban. Now, this story is a great example of how to navigate a toxic relationship. If you don't know the story, I would encourage you to pause this video right now and read Genesis 29 to 31, and then come back to this video. So this is the story about Jacob leaving his family and encountering his uncle Laban. Laban had the traits of a malignant narcissist. He was definitely close to being psychopathic. He had a lot of the traits such as lying, deceitfulness, manipulation, cruelty, intimidation, lack of empathy, and treating his family and workers in his household as possessions and extensions of him rather than human beings. So I'm going to give you a few examples of how Laban's psychopathic traits manifest in his relationship with Jacob. 
So the first thing you'll notice, there was this beautiful love bombing that was happening at the beginning of Jacob's encounter with Laban. I don't know if I'd call it beautiful, but it was love bombing, where Laban greeted him affectionately and said to him, you're bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Now consider the context of Jacob's life when he encountered Laban. Jacob had been rejected by his natural father Isaac for most of his life. The Bible said that Isaac favored the older brother Esau over Jacob. So Jacob definitely had that father gap in his life and he was definitely ripe for an older man like Laban to be a father figure to him. And Laban must have taken advantage of that at the beginning of the relationship. And yet, that relationship blew up in such a terrible way at the end. The second thing is that Laban promised to give his daughter Rachel to Jacob in marriage for seven years of Jacob's service. So Jacob kept his end of the agreement, but when the wedding night came, when Jacob was due to get the wife he had worked for for all these years, Laban instead gave his daughter Leah instead to Jacob. So Laban cheated and deceived Jacob and made him work for another seven years for the other daughter, Rachel. Another way you see Laban's psychopathic traits manifest is in his lack of respect for his family members as human beings. He treats them as objects. He treated his own daughters as property. He couldn't have cared less that he stuck his oldest daughter, Leah, in a marriage where she would be unloved and rejected by her husband and a rival to her sister. Who would want that life? And fourthly, we read that Laban was a cruel master, changing Jacob's wages over and over, so he never kept his word. He always gave Jacob the short end of the stick, and it didn't matter that Jacob was his very nephew, his very flesh and blood, and even a son-in-law, and the man was actually caring for his daughters and grandchildren. None of that factored in into the way that Laban treated Jacob. Jacob and his wives had to live with Laban's abuse and cruel treatment for decades. And some of you watching may have been in relationships for that long with family members or spouses. Those narcissistic evil traits just become normalized because they're so entrenched in the person. And maybe for a while you had no clue about narcissism and narcissistic abuse. And then one day you just happen to be reading up on it and you're like, oh my goodness. It all makes sense. You realize that the textbook on narcissism that you were reading actually describes the person you're with to a T. It's like that person's photograph could have been inserted on the front cover. And so now finally you're getting an explanation on everything you can never clearly articulate, but where you knew something was deeply wrong. So now you became awakened and you've probably entered into an unraveling process. In the story with Jacob and Laban, Jacob served for 20 years. And you know, Laban lies to him, deceives him, intimidates him. So by the time God tells Jacob that it's time to leave, Jacob is too terrified to do it. God had to get the message to Jacob three times before he finally took action. So you have to realize that Jacob at this point is really putting his trust in God. He has no idea if he leaves, if his uncle is actually going to kill him or take away all his family by force and his flock and his possessions. So in the end, Jacob chooses to flee when Laban is not aware of it. It takes about three days for Laban to catch on. So that is a typical response of someone who has been through narcissistic abuse. The thought of leaving is terrifying because you know that if you cross the narcissist, they see you as their enemy very, very fast and then they set out to destroy you and see to your demise. So after Jacob flees, Laban gathers all of his household into an army to pursue Jacob. But amazingly, God intervenes. God encounters him in a dream and says, be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. Basically telling him, keep your mouth shut, Laban. Don't say anything, don't do anything. That was pretty incredible to have that intervention from God. Because I'm sure if God did not intervene or say something to Laban, Laban would have surely taken everything back from Jacob and sent him away empty handed. Who knows the kind of damage he would have inflicted on Jacob because that's what narcissists do. They lack empathy. They play the victim. They blame shift and they tend to send people out destitute. They will extract everything they can. And that's the kind of character Laban was. It's very telling at this end of the story 
Jacob finally gets so angry by his uncle's arrogance and maltreatment, he gets the courage to confront him and says to him, what is my crime? How have I wronged you that you hunt me down? I have been with you for 20 years now. Your sheep and goats have not miscarried, nor have I eaten rams from your flocks. I did not bring you animals torn by wild beasts. I bore the loss myself, and you demanded payment from me for whatever was stolen by day or night. This was my situation. The heat consumed me in the daytime and the cold at night, and sleep fled from my eyes. It was like this for 20 years I was in your household. I worked for you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flocks, and you changed my wages 10 times. If the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had not been with me, you would have surely sent me away empty-handed. But God has seen my hardship and the toil of my hands, and last night he rebuked you. So this was likely a healing moment for Jacob, where he could finally use his voice and express himself and lay out the truth about what his last 20 years with Laban was really like. And Laban's response is interesting. He says, the women are my daughters, the children are my children, and the flocks are my flocks. All you see is mine. Yet, what can I do today about these daughters of mine or about the children they have born? So even in Laban's response, he never takes responsibility. He never admitted that he treated Jacob unjustly or that Jacob rightfully earned everything he had. Instead, Laban played the victim. He blame shifted and deflected, making it seem as if Jacob stole everything from him. When it comes to a narcissist, they will always impose their version of reality on everyone else. They refuse any other reality that conflicts with theirs. And that is how they manipulate. That is what you call gaslighting. That is what Laban did in his response to Jacob. He didn't acknowledge anything Jacob said, but reframed everything according to his reality. And that's how a narcissist operates. And that is how Uncle Laban operated with Jacob for 20 years. So how did that relationship end? Well, God instituted a boundary to be set up. Both parties set up a pile of rocks and basically made a vow to each other that neither party would cross over to the other side to cause harm to the other. Each party was to stay on their side. This was a barrier that God instituted so that Jacob and his family could move forward into the new life God was calling them into and never have to look back again. That's a pretty radical ending, I'd say, for a 20-year relationship which was never really a relationship. And it wasn't just the ending of the relationship between Jacob and Laban, but also between Laban and his daughters and Laban and all his grandchildren, all his extended family. This goodbye was like a death or a funeral in many respects. And sometimes relationships have to end that way. It is biblical, it's not wrong. And God himself can be the one orchestrating it. And I believe he does orchestrate endings like that when we find ourselves in relationships with certain toxic people who persist in harmful ways. You may have been in a relationship with a very toxic person, a psychopathic person just like this man Laban, and then God freed you from that relationship. So now it's over whether you had to cut ties with a family member or a close friend or whether you had to get a divorce or a separation. You know, the Bible says God hates divorce, but I also add that he hates oppression and abuse and injustice. So you may have had a terrible ending with a toxic person and you struggle with feeling bad about it. There's a stigma somehow attached to being estranged from someone. Like people might say to you, couldn't you have tried harder to get along? There's this temptation to feel this guilt or shame, especially if people around you don't understand narcissistic abuse or any kind of abuse and the measures you had to take to get free from that destructive relationship. Sometimes you might even feel bad because you think, well, doesn't God love family and doesn't he want relationships to be strong? But it's not always the case. God is a God of restoration and redemption, but he's also a God of division. That doesn't get preached much in church, but Jesus did say that he didn't come to bring peace to the world, but a sword, a sword that would separate family members. 
So you need to understand that not everything can be warm and fuzzy in life. When Jesus comes, there will be massive disruptions, massive separations and divisions. You need to know that just because someone is family doesn't mean that you stay with them if they're being abusive. That's no reason to stay in a relationship with an abusive person. Sometimes we feel this inner pressure to believe there is something we can do to fix it. That maybe there could be a change because after all, there are so many scriptures referring to God restoring things, redeeming things, reconciling people. So we always want that happy ending. And sometimes it's hard to swallow that an ending has to be a permanent separation. But I'm just telling you right now, sometimes that is what's needed. And it's about not going back anymore to that place. It's about having the same attitude as the Apostle Paul when he said, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. It's also like following the same instructions that the angels gave Lot and his wife when they had to run out of Sodom and Gomorrah and never look back. Sometimes that's how it is leaving narcissistic abuse. You just have to set that boundary in that relationship and cross over into a whole new space in your life and never look back. A good video that goes with this one is the video called, Why Should You Not Pray for the Narcissist? I believe that video will give you some helpful insights about moving forward with your life in addition with this video. So I hope these insights were helpful for you. If you know someone who is in an abusive relationship and trying to navigate, share this video with them so that they too can get the insights in this video and how they can move forward. If you have left a toxic or abusive environment and you're in a season of transition, I have a gift for you. It is a training on three key ways to navigate the difficult transition. These are keys that brought a massive breakthrough in my life when I was going through a difficult transition. I have included the link below. So this brings me to the end of my video. If you would like to see more content from me and have not subscribed yet, click that subscribe button and click that bell so that you can get the alerts because every single week I will be posting a new video to empower you to navigate toxic relationships in your life. And if you like this video, please give it a like. This channel is still new, so your like just helps me to know what kind of content you like. And if you have suggestions of other topics you would like me to cover, please feel free to drop those ideas in the comment section. Thank you so much, and thank you for watching. I appreciate you. Until the next time.